All right, so let's begin again with 802.15.4 standard which is used in many of the other IoT protocols. We are just going to, the reason I'm presenting 802.15.4 is because we want to talk about some of the topology issues, okay? So first of all, 15.4 is the base on which many of the standards are made. So 15.4 is used by Jigby, is used in 6 flow pan, is used in wireless heart, MyY and ISA 100.11a. So if you go to buy a product, you will never hear 15.4, you will hear one of these other names. Okay, because that is how they are sold in the market. And most, most popular of these is Jigby, right? So we will discuss Jigby in one of these later lectures, actually the next lecture after this. And um, so we are just going to finish 15.4 here. So 15.4 is a low rate wireless personal area network. Okay, so two things you notice, low rate. So this is not designed for very high speed video or anything. This is just for IoT devices, that's why it's low rate. And personal area means it doesn't go very far either. And that's how you save. And then it uses 2.4 gigahertz band, which is the same band which is used by Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And in that band, there are 80 megahertz available. And so we use 16 5 megahertz channels. Okay. Now we noticed there that for Wi-Fi, we use 20 megahertz channels. For Bluetooth, we used um, one megahertz frequency hopping, right? So we had 80 channels, 80, actually you can call them channels or 80 frequency things and then we just frequency hopped. Here we are having five megahertz channel and um, you get 250 kilobits per second out of that and only 50 kilobits you get at the application. So. So phi rate means this is how the bits, if, if, you, if you notice the bit on the wireless and you will no, notice there are 250 kilobits going per second. But most of these bits might be overhead and other things. And by the time you reach the application, you get 50 kilobits. And um, so how much current, it depends upon the symbol rate. So basically that is a standard. The peak current depends upon the symbol rate, multi-level, 4 bit per symbol. So what they are saying is that you take 4 bits just like we do in QPSK, not QPSK, QAM16, we take 4 bits and then make a symbol out of that and that is what is used and so the current will depend upon how many, how many, yeah, we have 64 QAM, then of course it will be different color current than, you know, than 16 QAM, right? The larger the QAM, more the power required. Things which are similar to 11 are direct sequence spread spectrum, CSMA, CA, back off, beacon and coordinator. Okay. So this also uses direct sequence spread spectrum, which you know, that means that you take one, one symbol and make into many chips. Okay. And then you send those chips using a code. So that is first part. CSMA, CA, I was just describing in the other lecture and that was you sense this uh, channel and if there is nobody then you, you do a random number and then you start. Back off is sent. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> why does a, a higher qualm take more current? Oh, because it's just more work too. I mean like if, um, if you have to take 8 bits, convert into symbols or whatever, right? So it's just more work. and. The circuitry, the computation, the FPGA and whatever is required is a little bit more complex. That's all. It's electronics, so I mean, I, I can't go any more detail than that. Um, all right, so now the, we were back to here. Beacon. So beacon is same way. There is a beacon which is sent by the coordinator and the beacon has some information about, you know, whose packets are there uh, waiting and all that and when the time starts. And instead of access point, we have a coordinator. So, coordinator is a function which any node can become a coordinator. So, you just don't buy a 11, 15.4 access point. 
unlike Wi-Fi that there is an access point which is separate, here any device can become a coordinator. I think this is very similar to Bluetooth as well. Lower rate and short distance means low power, low energy and then every node has a 64 bit address. So this you have to understand and this is the key part that we know that each basically most of the devices have a 48 bit what we call IEEE 802 address or Ethernet address, MAC address right but now they have to have a 64 bit address and that 64 bit address is called EUI 64. EUI stands for Extended Unique ID and unique ID means it is globally unique just like the MAC address no other device will have that UI address anywhere in the world okay and so the way you get 64 bit is that you take your 48 bit in the 48 bit if, if some of you might remember how did they assign the very first bit is universal sorry uh, uh, unicast or multicast the second bit is global or local then there are 22 bits of manufacturer and then there are 24 bits which are assigned by the manufacturer so you get total 48 in case of ethernet here 40 bits are assigned by the manufacturer so they get 16 more bits to assign after the 22 bits that they are given by the by the international organization so they get total of 60 bits okay all right 64 bit so basically the last part which was 24 bit in ethernet is now 40 bit 16 bit longer and so you can just address more devices any question about 64 ui this is the important concept this will certainly be in the exam okay <coughs> any question about this none no segmentation reassembly simply because of simplicity MAC frame size is 127 bytes so very small frames okay with a payload of 77 bytes out of 127 about 50 or so are gone in the bytes are gone in the headers and you are left with 77 bytes so very small packets alright and that's by design that is what we need for small devices like sensor networks However, that will cause a lot of problem as we will see later on. Yeah, go ahead. Regarding the Corona variety, which is like going very fast, uh, is 40 bits uh, enough, you know, because each address should be globally unique? I mean... Is 40 bit good enough? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, when we were designing Ethernet addresses, and I remember that in 1980s, we felt 48 bit will take you to the whole universe. By the way, this is not this is not global, this is universal. Right? Universe is bigger than the world. Right? We can we can count the objects on Mars and every other place. That is the universe. Right? So we felt 48 bit would be good enough. Now when we came here in 19 whatever 2015, we felt that may not be enough, so we have 60, 60 bits, which is good enough. Alright? Before that, after Ethernet and between this, in 1991, we were still counting as to how many objects could be in the world and we thought that for IPv6, 128 bit is required. 64 bit is too small at that time. 64 bit is too small and 256 is too large, so 128 is the right one. And with 128 bit, you can address every single piece of sand on the earth. Okay, that's what they said at that time. And, um, but who knows? You see, I mean, sand may be too big a piece, we may want to address a molecule. <laughs> so, so right now it is 64 bit for this application, for this group, because before this we already had 128 bit. And we found out that that is just too big, it is just wasting money. You know, that's why IPv6 is not coming in because it's just too much time taken to address the people. If your name is so long, nobody will call you, you know, <laughs> because they take so much of um, energy to call you. So, here it is 64-bit. Yeah. 
from the previous slide, we said 64 bits for global addresses and 16 bits local addresses. Here is like global only. For the and which slide I said 16 bit? No, no, I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Hold on, no, no. So there are two extremes. <coughs> One is that we need to be able to address every object in the world. So we need 64 bit. If everybody needs a unique name, right? But we don't have energy to call their full name. I told you, if your name is so big, nobody will call you. Right? And so what you do is you give everybody a nickname. Right? At your home, they don't call you by full name with your name, your father's name, your, you know, thing like that. They don't call you at home. At home, they just call you by your nickname. So, inside the local area network, we will use 16 bits. Right? So, that is your local address and, and there might be other nodes which might have the same local address, but they are in their home. Right? This is globally unique. Actually, universally unique. Alright, so the, is that clear? 64 bit is the address that you come in and you say, okay, this is my 64 bit name, and then we give you a 16 bit name. Yeah. Why we need the global and local bit? The one bit. Yeah, because, okay, so there are two bits there in the front. One is called universal, sorry, uni unicast and multicast. So we may want to address a group of people, a group of nodes, Universally, for example, I want to send a packet to all routers in the world. Okay? To all bridges in the world. That is a multicast address. So, how do you do that? You need that bit, right? And the first bit, if it is, um, if it is zero, that means unicast. One means multicast. Okay? Second one is global or local. Okay, now this is a leftover from actually Ethernet. When we were designing Ethernet addresses, which are now called 802 addresses, some people wanted local addresses, which means they can change it depending upon where you take it. And the first floor, the address is different. The second floor, the address is different. And third floor, the address is different. So they were local addresses. And your address would be, you know, the third computer on the fourth floor in the fifth room. That's your local address. Right? So you could figure out your location from the address. That's what people thought the address was, your location, right? But some people said, no, 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 address should not be your location. Address should be your name, right? So those wanted you universally, they wanted they wanted them um, global addresses. So your address doesn't change whether you're on the third floor or fourth floor. It's the same, same address. You see what I mean? So that was the global address. So, so they said, okay, we will allow both. This bit will indicate whether it is a global or local. So if you put a zero there, this means global. If you put a one there, it means local. Okay? So we explain all this in the Ethernet address, Ethernet basically, I mean 473 again, you know, when we talk about Ethernet. And except there is only one exception to that 0 and 1. Every time I explain in in, Ethan, in in 473, I have to explain this. Except that when it is all broadcast address, all broadcast address is all 1. Okay? In that case, the second bit is 1. Does not mean that's a local broadcast. I, this is a, that does not mean it's a local address. It's a global address. So, all ones is only exception. Okay? That is always used for everybody, you know, basically, right? And um, globally. And so, I mean, so the multicast addresses are used for such things. Say, for example, you might have an address where you want to address all HP router, uh, uh, HP printers in this, in this building, right? You send out a multicast address R to, of course, we use it for all bridges for sure. So, if you want to say all access points, please tell me what is your name. So, we can have a multicast address. Okay? So, in the network management, multicast addresses are used quite commonly. Okay? Any other question about that? Alright, so after that, we talked about that segmentation reassembly is not, is not there and, and the addresses packets are very small. 
so one of the things that this 16.4 does is allows two topologies. It not only allows the star like we saw in the Bluetooth, it also allows mesh. Mesh means you know you could be connected to multiple nodes. Okay. And um, now there are two types of devices. So this is star and this is peer-to-peer -peer mesh. Um, there, is, there are some devices that have more power and therefore can do more functions. So they are called full function devices. And some which have less power, they are reduced function devices. And if one of the full function devices becomes a coordinator. Okay. So, in, in a sense, there are three functions. One is just be a node somewhere in the network. Second is be a coordinator. And third is be a leaf. Okay. The reduced functions are only the leaves. They, they can only be the leaf. They cannot <coughs> send somebody else's packet somewhere else. Whereas these full function devices can forward packets. All right. And coordinator can do more than forwarding the packets. It can hold your packets. It can make you sleep. It can go to, you know, there's a lot of other things that we'll see. Yeah. Uh, is there any reason uh, you titled it peer to peer on the bullet point but mesh on the diagram? Yeah. Right. So it's the same thing. Two names for the same thing peer to peer mesh. All right, so now you understand the difference between a star and the mesh, or the me star and peer to peer, and you understand the difference between RFD and FFD, right? And you understand the difference between FFD and coordinator, okay? So, all right, so what does coordinator do? Any FFD can become a coordinator, all right? So, when a network is formed, everybody says, okay, I want to become a coordinator, I want to become a coordinator, and then we elect one coordinator. Just like in the Ethernet, everybody says we want to become a root, and then we elect a root. Right? Yeah. But there we, we I, I think that we use based on the address. Right. But so, there is, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, there is, in the Ethernet case, there is a procedure by which we elect the, elect the root. And um, so there are several things such as priority, address, and so on and so forth. And whoever has the highest priority and the lowest address wins, right? <coughs> exactly the same thing can be done here. And that's a very standard practice is that you first take the priority. Why priority? Because the owner sets the priority. So the owner can say, my TV has to be the coordinator, okay? So that regardless of what its address is, if it's highest priority, then it gets the job. Okay? So highest priority, lowest address. If they have, you have more than one TV, then you have to decide whether which TV becomes the coordinator, right? So that's the idea here. FFD can become a coordinator, can also route messages to other nodes. RFDs cannot become a coordinator and can only be a leaf. <laughs> FFD that starts a pan becomes the coordinator. Okay? So that's another thing is that, you know, you could just say that, okay, I'm the coordinator. If you want to join, just come on and join. And if you join, then, you know, the, 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 he's coordinator by the default. That's easy. In the, in the star topology, all nodes, all communication is to and from the coordinator. So in this topology, you can see everybody is a leaf, and the leaf cannot talk to the leaf. They talk to the coordinator. In P2 P2 topologies, FD, FFDs can communicate directly also. So in the P2P, the communication does not have to go through the coordinator. It can just go straight. That's why it's called P2P. Each Pico net has a PAN ID and is called a cluster. So now this is this whole thing is called a Pico net. It has a personal area network, PAN ID, identifier, a network ID. And it is called a cluster. So you could have many clusters. Nodes join a cluster by sending association request to the coordinator. And the coordinator assigns a 16-bit sort address to the device. And they use 64 bits. So basically what happens is in your home, you have 
let's say in an apartment in in, in a big apartment let, let's start with a shopping mall okay in a shopping mall there are many shops each of them are using jigbee let's say right so you don't want your jigbees to come and be controlled by the next door neighbor right so you will have your own cluster your own coordinator they will have their own cluster their own coordinator and so and then so there is a quite complicated procedure by which you make sure that they know who is their master so it's like when you get a remote controller you get anything you have to associate them and once they're associated they know what they control who controls whom and all that right so basically after that procedure is done then every node knows who is their coordinator and what network they will join when the power is turned on okay questions uh, so can the network have more than one coordinator okay so basically that is something that one can do although the it would be more like a standby coordinator rather than a full coordinator like in the sense that i could be a coordinator and if i die you know somebody else will somehow you know have all the information as to who the members are and things like that and then continue the network but just one is enough so i i read that like if you only have one that's when it's the pan coordinator because that's when it controls the entire network but within the network itself you could have more than one coordinator okay hold on hold on hold on so what you are saying is you read somewhere that a network could have Okay, let's see. So right now, let's just assume that there is only one coordinator in the whole network, and there is only one pan, and, and so I will have to figure it out later on and with you as to what you read, right? So let's just assume there is only one coordinator. Now, once you join the network, then we use only 16-bit address, just like I said before. Okay, so you get your nickname, and so whoever joins first gets the number one, number two, number three, and so on and so forth, and then. generally the put network doesn't really reach 16 bits but this is designed for 16 bits so now the whole network maybe this is what you read the whole network could be many clusters right so here is a cluster there is another cluster there is another cluster and the devices the information can go from cluster to cluster to cluster it can go from here to there right so each cluster is a pan and each pan has a coordinator right but many pans can be connected together and the packets can go right and we'll talk little bit more about the connection in a minute <coughs> so um for, and you can see ffds and 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 rfds and one thing you should notice is that if they are connected to two devices they cannot be rfd rfd can connect to only one device so they are always the least anything that can connect to two devices is a full function device okay and the whole thing is a tree so if you were to hang off you see if no longer a mesh as we shown in the beginning so there is no loops anywhere inside or outside coordinator has another ability to become a coordinator for a subset of the nodes and the, the trees so what can happen is now this is what i think you are probably talking about is that if this is the coordinator and all these nodes join that tree join that pan then this could say well i think these guys are too far from me and it can ask this ffd to become a coordinator so now there are two ids okay yeah in practice is there like a a common radius for a personal area network or could these things go yeah so in fact the question is in practice is there is a common radius so the radius is not specified by the standard but in practice what happens you go to the next room there is no network so power level puts the limit as to how far your network will reach 
and then you will have to either put a bridge or something to, you know, connect devices in that room. Okay? <coughs> and that's what exactly here is happening, is that you are here and then you want to connect these here, then you, I think more than that device automatically saying anything, the person who owns all this will set up things so that they have different pans and they are connected. Yeah. Why the pans does not connect directly to the other? Why do you have to have a full function devices between them? Because we shouldn't have anything to do. Okay, now let me see. Your question, but first sir, let me understand your question, then I will answer your comment. I mean, the band coordinators, why they don't connect them? Okay, so why you are saying, why don't we just connect this to that? Yes. Just like we do in Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. Reason we cannot do that is because we don't know where it is sitting. So this could be on this corner of this room, and that could be in another corner of that room, and there is no wire. I mean, this, these things are not connected to a wire, right? In Wi-Fi, the idea was that the base stations are connected by this backbone, right? And we do that by design. I mean, all of these, you see this, I think this is a base station probably, I don't know. And, and so that is connected by a wire in the back, right? And so they can be connected. But here, this cannot reach, there is no way this can reach there. Because of the distance, right? So the only way whoever is near there connects to whoever is near there on the other side. So these two happen to be on the on the on the edge, and they get connected, right? Okay, your question. No, I said that we cannot even have any loops, so we cannot connect the pan um, coordinators together. We cannot have loops. Loop. So loops. Cannot, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's see, saying that it will become a triangle if you connect it like that. Okay, that's a valid one, but I think the main reason is the, the distance. Okay, good. So far, so the main idea of giving this lecture was so that from now on, when you read any of this, you will see a lot of FFD, RFD, RLF, FFD, RFD, MESH. These are things that people discuss, and you have to know that. All right, so the MAC is Beacon Enabled CSMACA. Okay, this is very similar to 11, so I will go a little bit faster. A beacon comes on and it has all the announcement as to what is the name of the network and how long is all these different parameters. Anyway, so the beacon interval is every so often the beacon in comes on, you know, could be a few seconds. And then it says that, okay, so the my super frame duration is so much and out of that super frame, so much is my contention um, free pro time and this is contention access pro time. So, during this time you have to contend and during this time you are guaranteed. Okay, so, there is some reserve time during which the periodic devices, they just are already guaranteed. It is a guaranteed time slot GTS. They are guaranteed, so they just come and transmit and, and go away, right? And then you notice that there is a lot of time where nothing happens. So that is already declared that nobody will transmit or receive during that time. Everybody is sleeping. Okay, so that is night time. And so, I mean, just night time, it can be in the day as well. But basically, you know, there is a lot of sleeping here. And then this is, um, there are some contention slots and then there are some guaranteed slots. The guaranteed slots are in the contention free period and the contention slots are in cap. All right, any question about that diagram? So, now the standard, when you go to standards meetings, people are saying different things, and so it allows a lot of possibilities. Every possibility is accepted. Okay, so there is a beacon-less operation as well. And beacon-less operation uses unslotted CSMA -CE CA. So what is unslotted? Slotted means there are particular time, you synchronize the time and then the slot starts and then if you if you don't do in that slot, then you go to the next slot. So there is a fixed period of time. Unslotted means continuous time. There is no particular instant which is better than the other instance. So unslotted means continuous time and CSMA, CMA, CMA means that basically you go do the carrier sense and do your random access from that point and so on. So that is also allowed. Acknowledgements if requested by the sender. So the acknowledgement is sent 
when you get a packet, some bits in the packet, header will say that this needs to be acknowledged. <coughs> a short interframe spacing is the previous transmission is shorter than a specified duration, otherwise long interframe spacing. So, <coughs> so you you either use a short interframe spacing or long interframe spacing. And um, so if the previous one was very short, you send the short. If the previous one was long, you send the long. So the spacing is how far you wait before you can even sense the medium is this lifts or sifts. And the acknowledgement time is fixed. Basically, generally, in most of the protocol that we will see and that I have seen so far, the act comes within one sift. So whenever the packet comes, you wait for the short interval and then you send the act. But this is more for, you know, in between the frames. So you send the frame, and now if you send a long frame, then you wait long, and if you send a short, I mean, if, the, if not you send, if, you, if the previous frame was short, you wait short. Okay? This is the one we were already talking about. I think this is standard, so I'm going to skip that. We are done. Now, So this is all about 15.4 and I'm going to change the topic. So before I change the topic, any question about any of this access thing that we talked about? Okay, all right. So now we are going to go into something called ultra wideband. This is a whole new technology. Before, I, so, so the thing about UWB, ultra wideband, UWB, is the, to understand the time domain and the frequency domain. If I have a sine wave in the time domain, what does it look like in the frequency domain? Impulse. Impulse. Everybody understand that? Is that all the power is concentrated in one frequency. So this is a power on the y-axis, frequency on the x-axis, it will look like an impulse. On the time axis, this is the time and this is the power, it is a sine wave. Right? Same thing if you do the other way around. These basically are symmetric. If you have an impulse in the time wave, it will be a constant function in the frequency domain. We can call it a unit function. Unit function is the one that starts at zero and remains constant to infinity. And um, the so the impulse becomes a frequency it becomes in the time domain becomes a constant power in the frequency domain. The main question is what is the height of this power? Well, it depends upon the height of the impulse. If you, and what is an impulse? So, suppose I, I make a big noise, boom, boom, that's an impulse. As I put a lot of energy in a, in a microsecond. Right? So, basically, if you don't make that big noise, if you make a very little noise, it's a still a noise and it's still an impulse and it's still some energy is transmitted in the frequency domain. This is very important to understand. Time domain and frequency domain. So some people realized that if we want to, if this is the case, then we can send some impulses such that in the frequency domain they will become power which is very little, although it is on every frequency. And it is so little that it is below the noise level. So you won't even hear it in the frequency domain. In the time domain, you will. But in the frequency domain, it will be very low power. And so that became interesting because now we can use all the spectrum which is used by the world. Let's say you have a plane. You know, plane is going and they have reserved a spectrum for some frequency. But they are allowed to have some noise. Right? That below this is noise. In that noise level, you can just send your information. All right? So, for example, when the computers are designed, they are certified by FCC and there must be an FCC certification somewhere in the back. What that means is that if noise level is below the noise level set by FCC. All right? Now I can design another equipment that produces radiation which is below the noise level and FCC will say yeah, this is fine. And now it can use any frequency. 
because it is just generating noise, nothing else. And with that noise, we can do communication and some very high speed communication with very high data rate. So that's the whole idea of ultra wide band. Ultra wide band. It is not just limited to a small frequency domain. It's ultra wide. And so this ultra wide band basically uses maybe from let's say from 1 megahertz to 1 gigahertz or one, 10 gigahertz or something very wide band. Okay. And but it keeps the level power level below the noise level. All right. So here is a picture. When you use a cell phone, you are sending about zero dB, zero dBm per megahertz. Right? Zero dBm is one milliwatt, whatever. Right? And minus 40 dBm is the noise level, which is set by FCC Part 15. Minus 41.3 to be exact. So anything below minus 41.3 dBm per megahertz is considered noise. Okay, no working device should be affected by it because you should design the working devices so they they are not affected by the noise. So you put your CRC, your error correction, everything else so that if, the, if there is a noise like that, it will be taken care of. And so if you communicate below this minus 41.3, then you are legal. I mean, not so far. I mean, basically you could be, you could be using it without disturbing anybody. So, so this is FCC rule, this restrict the maximum noise generated by wireless devices to minus 40. It is possible to generate very short sub nanosecond pulses that have a spectrum below the noise level. Okay, so you can get gigabits per second using 10 gigahertz spectrum. And FCC said, yeah, that's fine in 2002. In 2002, FCC said, it's okay, no problem, you can do that. And so people started working on this standard at IEEE. And, um, and so that can be used for very high speed communication over a short distance. Because there is not much power, so it cannot go very <coughs> far. But it can be very high speed. And UWB can see through trees, underground, collision, and so on and so forth, through the ball motion detection, and so on and so forth. So, anyway, so interesting thing is because it is not just one frequency, you know, it has some low frequency, some high frequency, and so on and so forth. The low frequencies can go through the walls much better than the high frequency. You know, the light cannot go through this wall, but 2.4 gigahertz can, and if you have below that, it may be 1 megahertz, that can go even more. So, UWB has many applications, okay? And let me tell you some applications that, um, so we wrote a paper, actually, so one of the students attending the same course here, five, ten years ago, five, six years ago, wrote a paper on UWB. At that time, it was a novelty. Now, it is in every book. So, it's not a novelty. And so, I got a call from somebody saying that, oh, we want to use this in our medical application. And the application is basically, you can look inside the, your stomach, you can do baby scanning or whatever they do, um, things, you know, or disease scanning, anything, using UWB. Okay, so UWB is very, very, I mean, it, it is position tracking and you can measure things distances up to few millimeters and centimeters. So if you have some very high value assets, suppose you have a diamond behind this wall, you can monitor using UWB, it has not moved. But if somebody steals it, you will know. So there are many applications of this. But in network, yeah. And there is one, I think it was the zero DBM, it's, it's a limit for... Power, okay, so what this says is zero dBm per megahertz, <clears throat> and um, now this question is: Is this the real number for the cell phones? I don't know. I I think the cell phone number is much more complicated than zero. Zero is we are taking just as, as a reference, but because if you are in one gigahertz band, there is some power limit. If you are in three gigahertz band, there is some power limit. If you are sixty gigahertz band, is, you know, so there is all kinds of limits which are very complicated. So zero is just the reference point. I, I mean, uh, it's, it's a limit for what? It's a, it's a oh, so the thing is, okay, so what it is saying is in the normal communication, okay, so there is a limit for every transmission, that you know, is that you cannot just, 
to start you know putting a lot of wireless radiation here otherwise it will be microwave right mm -hmm. so it's a maximum power level yeah power level that you can use in, in cellular communication let's say um, and, uh, and cell is just simply an example i mean in any communication there is a maximum power limit which is generally very small otherwise you know you know microwave uses the same 2.4 gigahertz they run on the same frequency that we are using for wi-fi but they are sending, as I said before, they, they are using 700 kilo, um, 700 watts of power, as opposed to we are using 7 milliwatts of power. That's the only difference. <coughs> so, <laughs> right? So, so anyway, so that is just what I'm saying is that let's say normal communication uses zero minus 40. Minus 40 means minus 10 raised to 4. Sorry, 10 raised to minus 4 means one ten thousandth of that is noise, right? What is minus 40 dBm? You know, if you convert into ratios, it will be 10 raised to minus 4. Every power of 10 becomes 10 dB, 10 dB, 20 dB, 30 dB. And we just get used to thinking like that, so that 30 dB I know is 1000 and 40 dB is 10,000. All right, so this is how we, uh, so, so this is how they started doing it. They said if I generate a pulse like this, depending upon how wide the pulse is, the energy will be distributed. If you make it very narrow, the energy will be distributed to very high in the frequency domain, very, very wide band, frequency domain, so it will be much lower. On the other hand, if I make it wider, then the frequency will be, Concentrated in a smaller, this one it won't be ultra wide, and the power will be large, and it won't be noise anymore. So to to keep under the noise level, what we do is we generate pulses which are very thin, right? Which means they, they are very narrow. And then how do we do zeros and one? So we can say, well, this is a one and this is a zero. This is just 180 degree phase, right? And so the phase can tell what is, whether it is 0 or 1 and the pulses can be as narrow as possible. So, so when the semiconductor switches be, started becoming available, then people were able to do this. Previously, they were not able to do this. The semiconductors, we can generate pulses which are in picoseconds, very narrow pulses. So the pulse width is 25 to 400 picoseconds. And now we can modulate them using amplitude, polarity, or position. Position, amplitude, or polarity. Position means if the pulse is on this corner, it is a zero. If it is on this corner, it is a one. So basically, you know, we can have four positions with two bits or one po two positions with one bit. That is position modulation. Amplitude modulation is how high the pulse is. And the polarity modulation is like shown here. This is positive and this is negative. By the way, um, that polarity is also phase. 180 degree is becomes that, right? So polarity modulated. Now, if you have 0 0.25 nanosecond, which is like 250 picosecond impulse, you can generate 400 billion pulses per second, and that can be several hundred megabits per second. So one group in 802.15.4 decided to use UWB based communication for short distance and um, using pulse position and binary phase shift keying modulation. Alright, now binary phase shift, we know what that means is basically phase depends upon the value of the symbol if you have a sending 0, 0. So you can just like QAM, you can have multiple bits and then you can do the phase. And then you can also use the position as well. I have another bit. So anyway, UWB, um, the advantage is that very low energy consumption. You don't spend too much energy. Line of sight is not required. It goes to the walls. Sub-centimeter resolution allows precise motion detection. So if, if things are moving even by my millimeter or centimeter, you can measure it with this. Pulse width much smaller than the path delay, so multi-path is very easily resolved. So basically what happens is these are nanoseconds and if I went there and 
came back and if I went there and came back the two paths will be different very different compared to the width of the first so we can figure out you know that this uh, different paths so it is easy to use our multi path and therefore we can use multi path to advantage and difficult to intercept because all noise nobody can figure out that is even happening all digital logic so very low cost and very small 4.5 millimeter square so you know how much is in millimeter half of a centimeter so this is probably 12 millimeter bit right there so one third of the pen's thickness so this is very good and um, there were two groups one was uh, saying that we should use direct sequence you know what that means is they take your bits and then you convert them into using a code into chips and then you put that into the into the coding basically into the pulses so this is using cdma and um and then and so this they felt that it was good for the body area network so if you have something in the body or around the body you can use this one the other group actually i, I have deleted some of this slide so that they, let me just tell you what really happened this says that this is the scheme used in 8.15.4 i think what exactly happened was there were two groups one was using this direct sequence cdma and other group was using ofdma ofdm and the two groups fought and fought and fought and then both were disbanded so i don't think it is being used okay but it might have come back i don't know so so that was the end of um, uwb but i thought it was good to know what is going on so i i, I put the slides in because even though it is not being used it is good to know the concept Okay, 5 6 years ago when i taught this class and when the other guy wrote the paper um that time this was still in debate so 15.4 was discussing which one to use between the two and then the story was that one of the groups went to some other standards body like acma or something and got it standardized there and this group went to some other body and got it standardized there but um, neither one actually is being used um, in the 15.4 but this could be something to be checked all right any question about uwb yeah um, there is any formula to convert from pass to megabit is there a formula to convert from pass to uh, megabit per second okay all right, all right let's see you are saying how do you be convert pulses to megabits yeah. per second okay all right So what you do is, you take the bits and take a number of bits to make a symbol. So you maybe take four bits to make one symbol. Now those symbols, now you have to code, right? So before you code, you decide whether this symbol will be coded using CDMA or OFDM or whatever, right? So let's say we do CDMA and CDMA says that four bits will become ten chips. Okay, now you have chips, right? Now you decide how this each chip is going to be coded, right? A straightforward method could be that each chip becomes one pulse, okay? Or it could be that you take two chips and make a pulse with a different position. So there is lots of possibilities. There are many levels where, from the starting from the bits getting to the pulses, there is a coding of many different kinds. and then modulation so yeah so that's why i didn't put exact formula there and it's not very easy to say that why 100 why not 200 well you can get 200 too i mean so thing is but so that's just hundreds megabits very approximate because a lot of details there okay any other question All right, so UWB is um, actually there was a lot of talk at at that time, actually six years ago. But um, now people have found better ways of doing high speed. Sixty gigahertz is there, so some of this has gone away. Sixty gigahertz is right now, you know, kind of thing that we will use for gigabits and so on and so forth. Last slide. 
15.4e. So 15.4 has several A, B, C, D, so, so on and so forth. And I left the 15.4e slide here because it is um, it does some things that we might need in Zigbee or you know wireless art or something. So that's why because there are more standards than we can talk in one semester, right? So 4e. Okay. So 4e. Um, so this is, in, in this one you do a deterministic operation with the pre sign slots. So everybody gets a slot and you just speak in your slot. So that's basically it, is that you know you come up whenever your slot comes up, you say something and then you know you go away. So that is low latency deterministic operation. Channel adaptation, different channels used by different nodes for contention free period. And so you remember the contention free and the contention access cap and CFP. So in the contention free period, multiple people could talk because they are talking talking on the different channel. Okay. Then it also allows time slotted channel hopping. So higher layers coordinate the slot allocation along with its frequency. So now if different people can use different channels, the question is can one person use different channels and that is also allowed, that is channel hopping. Is that you are transmitting on channel 1 and the next time you might transmit on channel 3 and then next time you channel 53 and so on and so forth. You could do the channel hopping. Good for industrial environment. Each device can select its listening channel. Now, so if you are going to hop all around and people are going to use different channels, then the question is which one should I be listening to? So here they said the listener decides the channel. Okay. And so I am only listening to channel 5, let's say. And if you want to talk to me, then come and talk, then transmit on channel 5. So you have to find out where there is talking. So basically each device selects its listening channel, and the transmitter and receiver coordinate their cycles so that you know you talk on the listening channel, transmit only when requested by the receiver. And of course because the receiver is listening, two people cannot talk at the same time to the receiver and uh, so basically <coughs> you ask just like RTS request to send and then you get okay I like you are clear to send. So that's the kind of operation which happens in 15.4e and uh, the reason I talked about this 15.4e is because I think one of the standards in the list with that we saw before uses 15.4e. Any question about this? This is kind of very rough uh, indication of what happens in 15.4e. <coughs> that instead of doing CSMA CA, we just do fixed allocation. So this is only good for very small number of nodes. And that brings us to the end of this module. Five key messages that IoT fueled initially by smart grid is resulting in many competing protocols, Bluetooth, smart, Zigbee, etc, etc. 15.4 is a low data rate wireless personal area network. Um, Phi and make layer used by many IoT protocols, Zigbee and wireless are, those are the two very common ones. And then main thing I wanted to say here was that you need to know that there is an FFD, there is an RFD and there is a coordinator and then there is a cluster, mesh and star etc etc you know. <laughs> then there are the slotted and unslotted version of the CSMACA and then we also saw the deterministic transmission. And finally we talked about UWB, okay. So these are the few new concepts we saw, UWB. Um, FFD, RFD, slotted and unslotted operation. Yeah, any question? So there is no homework, this is okay. Alright, Wikipedia is there, that's it. Then we go to the next lecture.